and we are live we're supposed to be live hi dominique hi how are you i'm good thanks how are you oh, very good very good are you still uh kind of surfing on that on that emotion on the positive emotion of winning the the 3mt final uh, yes i definitely um i've been <laughs> thinking about it a lot and talking about it a lot so it's been really nice yeah that's uh that was a great event all you were all super inspiring 3mt was not something that i that existed when i was doing my phd um but you know it's i've seen three so far and it's always amazing how you know how inspired you guys are you young researchers but also it, it you know it's it's evident to me that you're a little bit out of your comfort zone so there's i don't know you feel looking from outside it feels brave it you want to be inspiring you want to get people to understand things that are probably you know that are much more complicated than what you can explain in three minutes uh, and all of this from within your phd and i find it amazing that it's now kind of a staple of the spring summer uh, <laughs> the spring summer season uh, in academia, in, in graduate school, so uh, it was it was really a great event, and uh, yeah, it, it was uh, it was last week at McGill at the faculty club. That was a nice venue too. <laughs> Very fancy. <laughs> Very fancy, um, and yeah, and that's that's where we met, and that's why we're here today. Because I thought, okay, I need to talk with Dominique, and then we talked, and actually, your story had you know so many more sides to it, and interesting. <laughs> points to discuss uh, that I'm super happy that you're here today. So right now uh, we we're, we're just here kind of uh, seeing if everything is going well with the live, which it seems to be. Let me just check on YouTube and then we can I, I'm, I can start with the interview. I just want to make sure that we are a lot that we are live here. We are perfect. Very good. So <clears throat> sorry to clear my throat um yeah uh so you are now at the lab i am yes <laughs> and so people will understand if someone <laughs> knocks at the door drops by whatever don't worry about that at all this is a live recording i will then uh after we finish our conversation i'll uh i'll edit this down for the podcast and so if ever if something happens unexpected we can stop and then restart so no worries on that side <laughs> sounds good <laughs> all right um if anyone watching if you are uh on youtube or here or on linkedin uh you can say hi you can let us know if the video is going well for you in terms of sound and vid and, and image too um but i think i'm ready to go on my side so uh people who watch know how this goes i'll pause a little bit I'll present you, Dominique, and then we'll go from there. Perfect. Welcome to this new episode of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. This week, I'm super happy to have with me Dominique Lu. Oh, Dominique, how do I pronounce your family name right <laughs> before I start? And then... Yes, so it's Luar. Luar. Okay, yes. with the okay, like a kind of a French air at the end. Yes, Can I ask, yes. what, does it come from France or from from somewhere else? Yeah, my dad is French. Okay, Louis. Okay, very good. Then I'll resume. I'll restart again. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Well, I usually I do that uh, before we start, and I missed it this time. So there we go. <laughs> Even almost five years after <laughs> being a podcaster, it that happens. But there we go. Welcome to this new episode of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. Today, I have the great pleasure of having with me Dominique Louer. Dominique is a fourth year PhD candidate in communication sciences and disorders at McGill University, specializing in neurolinguistics. Her research explores the intersection of bilingualism, brain function, and aging. She completed her undergraduate studies in linguistics at the University of Winnipeg and went on to earn two master's degrees at the University of Waterloo in linguistics and psychology, respectively. Drawing from her multidisciplinary background in linguistics and in psychology, 
Dominique advocates for holistic aging solutions, emphasizing the importance of factors like bilingualism in maintaining cognitive health. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time outside, drinking overpriced lattes with friends and bouldering. Welcome to Beyond the Thesis with Pap PhD, Dominique. Thank you so much for having me. So bouldering, can you, uh, this is a term that I didn't know. I think I can imagine what it is, but can you tell the audience what it's all about? Yeah, so bouldering is rock climbing, but without a harness or without anything okay. attached to you. So it's really just climbing without any of the attachments. I, I think I've seen some people bouldering in the Laurentians, and then you have these kinds of foldable mattresses that you fall onto. Is that the type of thing? Yeah, yeah. And I actually okay. do most of my bouldering at an indoor gym. So okay. they have all of the mats and equipment and everything for us Very to fall. <laughs> Excellent. I had to ask because I was curious, uh, you know, since ever since I read I read your, your bio. So um, clearly you're an active person. Um, today here the, we're talking about thriving as a first gen graduate student. So that's where we're going to go with uh, the conversation. But, you know, every journey starts uh, with a, a first step, with a starting point. And in conversation with you, uh, you shared with me something that was a bit troubling to me because I have children in school, uh, one of them in high school now. And something happened to you in school to do with your potential future in academia that really was uh, well, it was troubling to me just to think that it might happen to uh, one of my children. Can you tell us a little bit about this this event, this interaction that you had, and uh, and about because uh, it it connects with this question of being first gen with other things too that that you shared with me. But yeah, what happened uh, in high school that might that could have. Uh, changed your uh, your uh, uh, orientation your 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 journey uh, from being now in a phd to maybe not having gone into higher studies at all yeah so when i was in high school i struggled a lot specifically with math so math was definitely not my strong suit i think a lot of people can relate to this but i just had a lot of problems in math class and during one of the parent teacher conferences that the school held um, one of the teachers had a conversation with my mom where he he told her and i was also there um, but he told her you know your daughter is struggling a lot in math and i really don't think that she has the potential to continue her studies after high school. I don't think she's going to go to university. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that conversation, you know, it just, it really affected me. It really made me feel like a failure. Like I wasn't mm -hmm. good enough. I was, you know, and I, I was already having a lot of difficulty with this class in particular. And to hear him say that to sort of like shut me down and, you know, it, it just made me feel really badly about myself because mm. I did want to go to university. So this was around the time where we started thinking about university. So this is like the later years of high school where, you know, you're kind of thinking, OK, what am I going to do next? And mm -hmm. I had always planned on going to university. It was something that I was interested in. Um, you know, I, ha I had plans to to be a teacher and to go to school and that that's what I wanted to do and to have someone say that was really it was really hard to hear you know it really mm -hmm. affected me and i remember going home that day and just feeling so sad like i just didn't know what to do and not only did it affect me but it also affected my parents specifically my mom you know she really thought you know my daughter is just not gonna have a future mm -hmm. <laughs> in school and she really wanted me to go to school you know for her education is such an important thing and she she really believed this teacher who said that she said well he's you know he's with my daughter a lot he must know that she's just not competent enough and anyways that sort of it, it really affected me and it still affects me to this day mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it's big i i believe it's a it was a big misstep on uh, the, the person's on the, on his part, and uh, you're in you know at that age you're kind of trying to figure out who you are personally, 
uh, and, and, and more and, you know, in, in projecting yourself into a sort of future in terms of learning and work, etc. And to have someone tell you that uh, it could have totally uh, destroyed you and, and made you, if you had you know, believed and taken it to face value, you might have simply said, okay, uh, then I need to do something else with my life. Thankfully, mm -hmm. that's not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so what what happened after that so how how did you kind of digest that and you know and and move forward with your plans because one thing that i take from this story is your sadness at hearing this i think was the sign that you were actually you know destined to to be or at least your uh the, the path that was close to your heart was that was of learning more so that's yeah. why you were that sad at the at the moment. So that that could have been a sign for your parents of, yeah, you know, let's trust, you know, let's let's trust her a, a little bit and and let her let her move on. Was that what happened? It was, yeah. It well, two things happened. The first is that I did decide to go to university, but I actually changed what I wanted to do. So I was always really interested in science and psychology and biology. And the university that I applied to, they did have a psychology, they had a psychobiology program, which okay. to me would have been the most perfect thing to study. That's actually what I do now. Um, <laughs> but back then, because I was told, you know, you're not strong enough in math, I actually ended up taking a math course in high school that made it so that I couldn't study science in university. Okay. So the way it worked, so I, I went to school in the province of Manitoba, and the way it works there is that in order to go to university and to take science, you have to take calculus or pre-calculus in high school. But because I had this conversation with the teacher, he told both me and my parents, you know, she's not good enough to take pre-calculus. So they enrolled me in this, like, I forget what it was called, some type of, like, life math where you learn how to do your taxes and it, you know it's super helpful but it's not good if you want to go in stem or study sciences so Makes i took sense. that because i took that the only option i had was to do an arts degree a humanities degree which was fine and i loved it but i i decided to just study languages mm -hmm. so my first degree was very humanities focused you know i was studying linguistics and literature and sociology but i didn't take any math or science classes mm -hmm. so in a way that sort of it made it harder when i decided to pursue my studies because now i'm i'm very much in you know i'm in neuroscience so mm -hmm. a lot of math and science <laughs> um but back then i thought my only option was to just study languages and I don't regret that because I think it led me to where I am today but it definitely it, it hindered me a little bit in terms of what I ended up doing later so yeah it was more of a roundabout a roundabout path exactly started, you know, based on that choice that you had to make mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um and so you uh you mention uh difficulty with math um is that something uh you know, is that something that with time, because now you, like like we said, you kind of, uh, you know, came, you know, you kind of came full circle and are now working in the interface of neuroscience and linguistics. Uh, how 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 did you end up dealing with that supposedly, uh, you know, in, gets it's that supposed gap that would made it. That would preclude you from um, accessing this type of domain. What? How did you navigate that? Yeah. So when I had to start taking math classes during my master's degree, I was really stressed out about it. So you know, just with all this childhood experience of having really bad, a bad time with math and knowing that I was bad at math, I definitely felt a lot more stressed about it than I should have been. Um, but it was really just. I guess just having to like go through it and to, you know, to force myself to to persevere and just telling myself, you know, you can you can learn this, you will learn this, and just going through that initial step of like forcing myself to do it really helped. And it was so funny because I realized as I was taking these math classes during my master's that I was actually 
doing okay. I wasn't, I wasn't bad. You know, I was, I was getting good grades and I was, you know, there's still a bit of a, a lack of understanding. And I think that's because I didn't take any math during my undergrad. Mm -hmm. Um, but just realizing that, wait, I can do this mm -hmm. really, really helped me. And also asking for help too. You know, I, I went into this feeling, really, really scared, but knowing that there was people around me that I could ask questions to, um, you know, professors that are really receptive to different types of learning styles, that really helped too. And just having those conversations with people saying, you know, I've, I've always struggled with this, but I'm, I'm here to learn and I want to learn. I think just having that mindset of like, I need to do this to, to progress really helped. Mm -hmm. And then also realizing that it is something that you can do despite having difficulty. Like I think anyone can can learn a subject that they struggle with if that's what they want to do and if they have the right tools and the right support to yeah. them. And the right mentors. Like that, that person in high school was not the right person. They could have nurtured, you know, your your desire to to go to science and try to get you to learn. Maybe also, you know, you know, we, we go through life uh through the, our different ages maturing our brain matures and the way we are able to deal with stuff that was that looked super complicated when we were quite young we can now learn them because also we've you know we've done many more things and we we can now deal with data in a different way um but it feels like yeah there was some redemption there uh, to something that was i could, i just had an episode about uh, contamination stories and redemption stories and uh, you you really i think you came full circle with redemption of yes now i'm in neuroscience yes now i can use math in my in my research and uh i'm happy doing it and that's it's marvelous <laughs> <laughs> thank you now the episode uh, is titled thriving as a first gen graduate student and bef you know in our pre-interview we talked about different things that uh, throughout life have been obstacles at first one that we mentioned someone telling you you are not uh you know you're not built for research or for academia or whatever i don't you know they, they, they probably said it a different way but uh that was the message uh but then uh there there are other uh, aspects that you had discussed with me that led led to you uh, and and now, of course, this question with math is for sure one of them led to you de having to deal with imposter feelings at different points during this journey. Uh, uh, and and I'm sure because I, you're in graduate school, you're doing a PhD. Uh, I'm sure that imposter feelings come up sometimes uh, for you and for your colleagues. By the way, it's not just you. <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit uh, about a little bit more about? what other challenges you had to deal with like internally uh and and you know throughout your academic and now moving to almost this professional phase of your life that have to do with uh personal personal traits of yours but also this uh this problematic i'd say of not having within your family role models for keeping studying going to university going to graduate school etc cetera, etc cetera. can you do can you talk a little bit about that part of things and and how you you dealt with that along the way yeah so like you said i think this is a really common remark from a lot of grad students is that you know we're, we're dealing with this major major imposter syndrome um, but a lot of us are also dealing with a lack of support from people who are close to us, people who've also gone through this journey of grad school. And it wasn't until I got to McGill that I realized that a lot of people do have academic parents or siblings or people in their, their circle, their close circle who have PhDs. And it's, it's actually very common. And I didn't realize this until I started studying here. Um, but I think it's definitely, it's hard <laughs> to deal with being a first generation student, a first generation grad student, because you don't know what you're doing. And there's no one there to guide you and to tell you 
what to do. You know, there's a lot of people who, you know, they're very lucky and their parents are also professors. So they were kind of like built for this, you know, ever mm -hmm. since they were little, they always knew what a PhD was and they knew the type of work that it took to, to do one. And I think that that's a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. And I also just want to point out, I'm not saying that just because someone has an academic parent, it means that things are easy for them. That's not at all what I think. I think everyone struggles and I just want yes. to make sure people know that. Um, I'm very aware that this is difficult for everyone, but I think that there are certain advantages and disadvantages to to having, you know, support from your parents in that in that sense um, versus yes. not having anyone in your family. And um, what was I saying? <laughs> well, let, let me say something. So uh, I, I agree, like, a PhD is difficult for everyone <laughs> who's doing it. But it's true that if you have a sibling, a parent who's gone through it, uh, one of the first things that, that become easier is just the whole logistics of getting into a program, yeah. of of knowing, uh, you know, of kind of knowing the ropes of what is expected of you. Um, uh, also, st strategies to, you know, to plan your work, uh, to to publish, to write, etc. Uh, you know, it's a lot of unknowns to be dealing with when you're a first gen. That if you have someone uh, close to you who's gone through it, they can at least, like I said, show you the ropes, and that's already a big, uh, a big load off your shoulders in terms yeah. of having to discover and make sense and and uh, and uh, make the best out of. The, the short time that you have to do, to go through this ordeal. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many moments where I realize that, you know, not having that is, is difficult, you know, and one thing in particular that comes to mind is the process of grant writing. So, you know, as students, we often have to, to apply for grants or scholarships, you know, to get more funding or, or funding in general for our degrees. And, a lot of it is just very, you you wouldn't know what to include unless someone told you, hey, this is important, you should include this. Like I didn't realize until very late that I was supposed to be like talking about myself as though I was some amazing person who's done so many things, you know, like it's just when I first wrote a grant application, I was just writing the bare minimum. You know, I don't want to make myself sound better than I am. I just want to stay with there. But I didn't realize the amount of embellishing that goes into all of these applications. Whereas mm -hmm. someone who, you know, has a parent who also writes grants for a living, they could easily say, hey, you know, this is how you want to structure it. And this is how you want to, to frame yourself. And, you know, you want to come across as like, very, mm -hmm. very good and competent. And also the type of, um, of non-academic work that you need to do to get a grant. So there's so many things that you need to include in these applications. You need to be volunteering, you need to be teaching, you need to be working uh, as a research assistant, but also be, you know, doing your own work. You need to be publishing. You need to be on all of these different committees and you basically have to be doing everything that's mm -hmm. possible. And a lot of us don't know that. You know, we we do volunteer and we do serve on committees, but it's just, you know, it's it's not because we want to get grants. It's just things that we enjoy doing. But I didn't realize the amount of things you had to be implicated in just to even be considered for for this type mm -hmm. of funding. And I'm talking about like the more like, you know, provincial national scholarships, like the ones yeah. that are really competitive. Like no one no one tells you that, you know, like I wish I had known. OK, you know, if, as soon as I start my undergrad, I need to start volunteering in a lab. I, I didn't know. I, I didn't work as a research assistant until much, much later. Whereas some people, they already know from the beginning, okay, I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. I need to publish a paper, which is extremely time consuming and difficult. But there's all of these things that you just don't know until you're told or until you get that first rejection. And you're like, oh, Okay. okay, this what something didn't this? work, and I don't know what it was, but you know, it's it's kind of like a trial and error process rather yeah. than just already knowing and being told this is what you need to do. So I think that is like a good example of the the disparity between you know a first generation student mm -hmm. and someone who does have that support from a family member. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, 
yeah, it's the unknown unknowns. Those are the ones that are hard. And I, I went through the same, the same. Uh, you know, I went through it the same way as you, and I, I probably even did less than than what you have been doing. Um, and, and yeah, it's of course it's not a given that just because you have a parent who went to graduate school that they're gonna you know be re reviewing what you write, but. Um, but at least you know they're they're a good sounding board for uh, for at least you not going through things, you know, just happenstance and without uh, without strategy and and clearly there's a strategy to the whole system that if you're not privy to it, well, you you're just gonna not be able to to uh, perform as well. Yeah. And how did you? How was it then that you? Uh, learned about these things and and got to kind of fixing these these gaps that that you found. Did you find did you find community uh, with other colleagues? Uh, how did that happen for you? Yeah, definitely through through friends and colleagues that were also going through it. So I think one of the really important things is to find that community. You know, find people who who are having similar struggles as you and just being open about your problems and hearing what they have to say. And there are so many of us that are dealing with the same problems. And I'm very lucky that in my department, you know, I have really, really great friends and colleagues who are very supportive and very just nice people to talk to. And I think just talking to them, you know, getting their advice, asking for help, that's been so important and so helpful in my mm -hmm. journey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have you, have, do you have mentors outside academia, outside the lab, that also help you? Were you able? Not everyone finds them, but uh, I always ask the, I always ask the question because I think it's uh, it's there's potential to help people who are watching and listening. Yeah, definitely. So I've been very lucky to to work with a number of people who um, are not physically in Montreal, but that I can still stay in touch with, who've been really helpful throughout the process. So both in and outside of academia and yeah, past, I'm thinking of uh, past colleagues or past employers um, who I've stayed in touch with and who've been really, really great in, you know, supporting me and helping me through not only the academic side, but also the emotional side and the stress mm -hmm. and the, all the other stuff that comes with it. And I know I don't know if you have an example of of something a, st a little small story around that type of mentorship that you can tell, but maybe if you don't have a story to tell, maybe can you share a little bit uh, about how that relationship works? What you know, at what moment do you go uh, and and reach out to one of these external mentors, and and you know what's the dynamic of the the relationship? Why does it work and why does it help you? Yeah, so the person that came to mind when I was talking about this is um, a woman that I met through uh, the Wisdom Exchange Project. So this is a project that started at McGill, and it puts graduate students in touch with an older adult who either okay. lives in Toronto or in Montreal. And I'm very lucky to have been partnered with um, someone that I've become really good friends with, and she's she's in Toronto, but we actually talk once a week and she has been such a wonderful person to talk to so she's not an academic but she's someone that i look up to a lot um, both professionally and just in terms of the way that she is with other people um and you know because we have this set time that we're able to talk so i, I always talk with her on mm -hmm. tuesday afternoons i know that you know I get to chat with her about what's going on with me and with her and just kind mm -hmm. of have that conversation. So I don't necessarily reach out to her when things happen, but I know that I have that set time where I will be able to to tell her how things are going and to hear mm -hmm. from her too. And and so you get you get energized from just from that interaction from that from that relationship. I Can do. you tell the name of the program again because it it sounds like a really cool thing so if McGill students listening, hear about, listen, listen what, uh, what Dominique has to share because it sounds really cool. Yeah, it's called the Wisdom Exchange Project. 
And there's, I think it started at McGill, but there's a couple universities in Ontario as well who take part in it. And it was an initiative that started um, during the pandemic. So when people were experiencing a lot of, of loneliness and isolation. And as I mentioned before, the idea is to pair a graduate student with an older adult. And it's really up to the two people to decide what type of relationship they want to have. So in my case, we we FaceTime each other once a week for okay. about an hour. Um, but I know other people, you know, they'll just do like once a month, they'll, they'll call each other or even just text each other. So it's really open mm -hmm. um, to all different types of communication. But I really encourage people to, to look into that if it's something they're interested in, because it's a really great way to make a connection with someone who has a lot of life experience and who can sort of mentor you um, and help you out with things. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. And I recommend uh, the, the Wisdom wisdom Project, Wisdom Exchange. Yes, Wisdom project. Exchange Project. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, a question. So going back to your academic journey, you're now in the fourth year of your PhD. I just mm -hmm. saw you do a great job last week at a uh, three minute thesis competition here in Montreal. Congratulations again on, on that, you. on winning that. Um, but you said you made, you did two master's degrees. I, this is a little bit of a joke, but is this all out of spite for that teacher in high school? <laughs> Are you going so for a second PhD after this? <laughs> just for so many people make that joke. I've also made it. Um, well, you don't have to answer that. It, it, was a, it was a joke. Actually, my real question. So this was the funny, the fun, funny, jokey question. The real question is: You were super sad when you were told you were you weren't cut for academia, but you found uh, it in you uh, to keep on going. You went a different way a little bit because of, the, of math like you said and then you go on to do a first master's and then you do a second master's and now you're in a, a phd you're doing well you, you're communicating your science uh in, in, a, you know, in a very professional and, and effective way and that's that's you know at least from what i saw at 3mt can you share a, a little bit with us of what what it is that has been keeping you going in this journey uh into and through uh, the academic uh, the academic path let's say there's something yeah. in there that that you know some kind of uh, guiding star for you i feel yeah so there's a lot of different things that i want to say about this um first of all i definitely am <laughs> kind of thinking a lot about this past experience <laughs> and you know I, i'm i'm not doing my phd out of spite but there is a part of me that is fueled by this desire to just prove people wrong mm -hmm. and i know that's not the best motivator but it's working for me <laughs> and i think just having been told so many times you know it wasn't just this teacher there were there were other teachers there was you know people in my close circle who were kind of like you know you're, you're not very good at school and you know they didn't really see much happening for me in the future and i think those experiences and those interactions that i had when i was younger definitely it, it did something to me that made me really want to prove them wrong. So part of it is that, I won't lie, part of it is that, but I also do have this very big interest in, in what I do. So I, I love learning. I've always loved learning. For me, you know, being in school, being a student and having all these opportunities to learn about so many different subjects is so fun and I do love that. Um, I'm also really interested in the research that I do. So I've always had this interest in, you know, language and the brain and also working with older adults. That's something that I enjoyed a lot when I was when I was younger. And so combining all of these interests is something that, you know, it helps. I think it really helps when you're you're passionate and you're interested about what you're doing, but also thinking a lot about those past experiences and mm -hmm. just saying, you know what, I need to do this. And there have been moments where I really wanted to stop my studies. You know, I actually went through a big period of burnout a couple of years ago, um, about halfway through my degree, where I was just so tired and so 
like mentally exhausted that I actually took a leave of absence from my program because mm -hmm. I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, but throughout that time, I was really reflecting on, on this goal that I had put for myself. And I thought, you know what, if I stop now, I'm never going to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. I think that if I, if I quit, I just, there's a part of me that would just regret it so much and not be able to, to feel at peace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I really want to finish my PhD just to like, you know, say, you know, yeah. I did it and it's Mission done. And close the chat. Yeah, it's like yeah. this big journey, you know, it's been 10 years. Like I just, I really, really want to finish it. And I just keep telling myself, you know, you're going to be so happy and so proud once it's done. And that's what I repeat to myself all the time when I'm thinking about quitting. Cause I did, like I said, I did go through that period where I was like, I think I'm done and I think I'm going to stop. And, you know, I talked mm -hmm. to my supervisor and I talked to a lot of my colleagues and I said, I think this is it for me, but then I came back and mm -hmm. now I'm really set on, on wrapping things up and finishing within the next year or so. So Very good. a lot yeah. of us go through that experience of considering mm -hmm. quitting. Um, it, of course, if, uh, and I, 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 I may be, and I'm, I am repeating this. This is not the first time I say this, but I think it, it needs repeating. If your mental health is paying too much of a too high a price for you to stick with the, this plan and to to uh, please someone who, for, you know, that you think expects you to accomplish this thing, that's a PhD you better take a break and even maybe stop because nothing is worth your mental health. Um, now, yeah. can I can I ask you, because I think this is very, very important, what, it's, t it's tough to stop because of what I just said. There's a lot of expectations outside, you know, there's this host of people that you want to, you know that you want to say here I, I have my degree too uh, uh, that, that we, we've already mentioned uh, but just again it's just a, the, just comic relief here but um, it's tough to, to decide I'm going to even to pause is tough because you can get this feeling of it's almost a FOMO type thing mm -hmm. but it's I, I can you know if I stop at the station I don't know if I can catch the train again can you go a little deeper into what that how that reflection was with you when when did the reflection or the the notion come of okay no i need to take a real break and consider if i'm going to finish this or not and and yeah i'm going to stop here and i have a follow up question but okay. how what made you get to that how was the path to that conclusion of okay i need to take a break yeah. So a lot of things happened when I started my PhD. I, I started in 2020. So the year of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was huge. You know, I, I moved to Montreal. I didn't know anyone in the city. Everything was online. So I didn't have any contact, any physical in-person contact with people. So already I was starting out on like a really bad note. You know, I was I was living alone. I, you know, all of my community, my friends, my family, they were not physically present in Montreal, which is a really, really hard thing. Um, and then there was a lot of restrictions in the city, the university, you know, all the classes were online. So I never actually got to meet my colleagues until well over a year into my program. So just wow. experiencing that isolation, that, you know, it just started on a bad note. Um and I know a lot of people had this experience as well. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it was really hard for, for all of us. Um, and then <laughs> two years into my PhD, my, my supervisor left. Oh. So when I started my PhD, I was working on a completely different project with a different supervisor. And for, for personal and professional reasons, she decided to leave the university and you know, I, I don't resent her at all for that. Like, I think she made the right decision for her, but that put me in a really difficult position because, you know, I was, I was two years in, so I'd already been working on this project and she just left. Mm -hmm. So I was now left without a supervisor and without a project. So I did take time, to, you know, a couple months to think about what I wanted to do. Um, the department that I'm in, you know, they had offered different solutions. They said, you can either 
stop and you know we'll give you a master's degree mm -hmm. um but i didn't want another master's degree mm -hmm. um we can you know you, you can just look around and see if there's other supervisors that'd be willing to take you but that was that was really hard you know i was i had no idea what to do like i i think that for me was like one of the really hard situations to navigate because i it was so unexpected and i didn't know what to do and it's also not something that had happened a lot in the department that i work in so no one really knew what to do they were mm. like we're so sorry this is happening but like we don't really have a solution for you like you're kind of just gonna have to figure it out and luckily i reached out to my current supervisor and she was like yeah you know like come come work in my lab and we'll we'll think of something so anyways that worked out really well but that really made things hard because it really it forced me to stop and it also made me think a lot about okay do i really want this because like already it's not going out like it's not starting on a good note like do i really want the rest of my my mm -hmm. phd to be like this and the third thing was i got really sick so i was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease um you know after I, I got covid and then i got really sick and i was just having all these like lingering symptoms which later turned out to be an autoimmune disease so it was just like obstacle after obstacle mm. after obstacle and at a certain point i was realized i was running on empty like i could not function i was feeling really really badly both physically and mentally um i noticed it in every aspect of my life you know i wasn't doing well um in my coursework i wasn't doing well in my my comprehensive exams i wasn't doing well in my social interactions you know with the people that are close to me like i just felt like really really bad like something mm. was wrong and so that just that accumulation of stuff was when i was like you know what this has gone on for too long i need to take a break mm. for my mental health and my physical health and just think about what is important right now which is getting better and yeah. you know because you can't you can't thrive like that like no. when you're feeling so poorly there's you're not efficient in your work you're not you know you're just not doing well so mm -hmm. it's really important to just take a break and it, unfortunately i realized that too late i think i let it get to a point where i was just really really unwell um but taking that break really made me realize, okay, this is important. Focus on what you need. And once you feel ready to start up again, then you can mm -hmm. go back if that's something that I wanted mm -hmm. to do. And turns out I did. But anyways, that was my no, that's perfect. <laughs> story. And, and you had the support of your supervisor to take that break, which is also great. Mm -hmm. So it's not a given for everyone. But I think it was the, the, it was the right thing to do because the thing is, if you give your health, physical or mental, to the PhD, and then either you stop, or you know you you end you finish the PhD, but then you don't have health or mental health anymore. If you once you're once you're out of graduate school, it, they're not going to give you back the, your your physical health, your mental health, or anything. So it's oh, if one of those two things are on the on the you know on the scales of what you need to choose. PhD or my health, health should always come in in first place, and I think you you did the right thing. And what is beautiful to me is that I look at you today, and you're happy about uh, you're happy with what you're doing. You're doing, you know, you're you're uh, taking part in events where you put yourself forward and end up <laughs> uh, having good outcomes from that too. Um, you're excited about your project. Clearly you have, you're passionate about your project, which also I found that it's a really cool one. We, we didn't really go deeply into it because that's not the, 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 the aim of the, the podcast, but uh, clearly you now have a sense of mission and finishing this project is part of that mission. And now you have all your, your, uh, you know, your batteries are full <laughs> to finish this this marathon. <laughs> that is the PhD. Yeah. One thing we didn't talk about, and that we had talked in the pre in the pre interview, was the fact that above all these things and this this like perfect storm that you had to go through in 2022, uh, they had to take this break. Um, you also mentioned to me that you if i don't remember if it was 20 anyway i don't remember the the year exactly but you also got a, a diagnosis that kind of puts you 
in, into uh, the neuro neurodiverse gamut of things. Was that also part of this whole complication of 2022 or 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 not? And, can, and please like, let the, the, the listeners know what we're talking about. Yeah, no, it, it definitely contributed, I think. Um, but yeah, when I was 22 or 23, now I can't even remember how old I was, <laughs> but around that time, I got diagnosed with ADHD. And I will say I wasn't shocked by it. The reason mm. I went to get the diagnosis is because I had a very strong suspicion that that okay. was causing a lot of my issues. Um, but, you know, having that diagnosis and realizing, you know, this probably contributed to a lot of the problems that I had when I was younger. You know, I mentioned my issues with math and school and, you know, this whole time, I think I was just having trouble learning because mm -hmm. there was so much else going on in my brain. And yeah, it, it definitely contributed to, mm -hmm. to, you know, all of these feelings and the burnout and feeling, you know, like I couldn't continue. And yeah, I think a lot of people, again, can also relate to that. Yeah. yeah. And now, so, and where I want to go with this is, again, another, uh, another element in this puzzle <laughs> that is Dominique, that is, that, can be seen as an obstacle to moving forward and yet you seem to have found a way uh, to follow your your passion to follow your dreams in terms of of your research uh, and and what you want to do in the future uh, can you talk a little bit about once you were and maybe we can go you know we can travel back in time to that moment where you, you you're sick you you ask your pi to take time off you do take time off. Uh, I don't remember how long you took off, but you're in the middle of this time off. You're probably starting to feel better. What is the inflection point? What happened in at, the, at the, this kind of key moment where you went from, ah, maybe this is not for me, maybe this is the universe telling me that I shouldn't be doing this, to, you know, when was this... And I imagine it's a morning when you wake up and you're like, no, no, this is actually my mission. Can you talk a little, can you talk to this? Do you have some uh, uh, narrative that you can glue to this, this, that I just said, this moment of, go, of going from, oh man, this is a perfect storm. I'm going to sink to then, you know what? I'm going to hang on and I'm going to resume and I'm going to finish. W what was the, the pivotal moment, let's say, or a pivotal reflection in how, how did you then say, okay, I'm going to use the resources that I have to deal with the problems that I have and, you know, make a good outcome out of this? I think the moment for me when I realized, you know, I, I do want to continue is just, so it, it was months of reflection. So I, I took, I took three months off um, during the summer and I actually, at the time I was also working at a startup, um, like a, a neurotech startup. So I wasn't, you know, doing nothing all day. Like I was, I was at this job and in that job, I had to do research. And part of this job was, you know, writing literature reviews and coming up with um, different studies that I could do and recruiting participants and testing participants. So I was still working in science. Mm -hmm. And every time I was at work, I kept telling myself, oh, you know, like I, I could be doing this, but with my own project. Yeah. And it's not to say that I didn't like what I was doing. I really, really liked the project that I was working on at that job. It's just, I was having these reflections every day of like, oh, you know, you, you were supposed to be doing this and you were <laughs> supposed to kind of be like deciding what you wanted to do for your, your project and your thesis. And I think having that, you know, that thought every single day while I was on leave, it really made me realize, okay, you know what, you need to go back and do mm -hmm. science because working, working at the startup, you know, I had so much fun. I loved it. It was a really, really fun job. Um, and it sort of confirmed to me that I do want to stay in this, this world of, of science and research, but I also wanted to, to finish what I had started so I think it was really helpful for me to have that on the side to sort of, you know, keep me busy mm -hmm. and to also, it, that made me realize, you know, I want to finish my project because I want to do, yeah. 
that, that's amazing because what that makes me feel is so you part of you stopping is all the, the the obstacles that we talked about part of it may have been and tell me if you agree you know part of it may have been uh, the, the the imposter feelings that you've had for a certain amount of time for sure and here you were outside academia doing research and having fun and having good results i feel that you kind of you kind of you know you slew the dragon of imposter syndrome by doing the thing that you thought oh maybe i'm not cut out for this outside of academia and then you're like oh you know what this is actually what i'm born to do and yeah. I'm, I'm i'm being a bit emphatic it's <laughs> that you, that's what you were born to do but it feels like that solved your imposter feelings Absolutely. I agree with you. I think having this other thing to work on, but outside of the context of academia, you know, it made it fun. And mm -hmm. I, I've talked to a lot of different people about this, but how how different the research atmosphere is outside of the university, outside of academia. It's much more laid back. It's a lot less pressure. Um, you know, these are all things that people talk about all the time, but mm -hmm. I was I was living that. I was I was experiencing it, you know, like going to work in in science and you know like a a neuroscience startup it was just confirming the fact that i do enjoy this and i do like this and it's something that i i want to do it's just the environment <laughs> that was so different <laughs> of course and of course no no it's amazing i, I really like it and, and and i think uh it, it shows first it, it proves something that i think is key for people listening uh to to know which is there is good and fun and interesting and valid science being done outside the walls of university yes and i'm not saying quit your phd to go do that but finish your phd and then you that's one of the things that you can do yeah. and uh, and here you were employed by a startup but once you finish a phd you may have a project that leads you to build your own startup that's mm -hmm. a possibility. So mm -hmm. I think that it's really, really cool that that you that that we got to this story because it's I think it's a very, very important one in all this process of yours of getting back to where you to you know, getting back on your feet, back on your horse and being where you where you are today. I, I really, really <laughs> think it was a pivotal moment for you psychologically, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And can I just add one thing? Actually? Yeah, please do. So I think, you know, you just mentioned like you can finish your PhD and go do that. And that was also a huge factor in me going back was just realizing, OK, you know, you're, you're about halfway, a little over halfway done. If you finish it, there is something waiting for you after. And I think I needed that because I think a lot of the times, you know, you're 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 in school, you're doing all these things and you're you are thinking about the future, but not concretely like you're not thinking like what exactly can I do after this but having that experience working in science outside of the university it really made me realize okay if you get your degree you know you have your PhD you can use this to do this type of work because a lot mm -hmm. of the startups you know you need a PhD or you need a an advanced degree and so for me it was more like a practical thing at that point and I was able to frame it of like in the sense of like, okay, if I if I get this degree, it's going to open doors for me and I can see myself doing something in the future with this degree. So it was really like the practicality of it really helped in my decision to go back. So it makes total sense. And I, and I, I love that you, thank you for interrupting me and sharing that because <laughs> it's a really, really important point. Dominique, we, we're the t time has flown. <laughs> uh, we, we, I don't, we've covered a lot of what, what we had discussed um i feel like uh like i want to uh to kind of sum up uh, a little bit what i'm taking home from this uh i i wonder whether there's there's uh, something that that you had want to talk and that we missed um but uh i feel we've got we you know we've got a, covered a lot of ground and uh and i think there's a lot of take-homes already uh in, in what you shared Did, was there something that that uh because oh I I know I remember it's the aspect of working while doing your PhD. Uh, Maybe that that can be another episode because we're almost at, at an hour I'm seeing here. Um, <laughs> maybe if maybe we can have we can, you know if if you have advice uh, for uh, for people who are in graduate school and who need to uh, you know who need to uh, do some work on the side. You told me that you've been you've always had jobs. 
uh, as you were moving through your uh, academic journey. Uh, is there a, a general, you know, some general advice around that? Uh, and, and think about someone who's a first gen uh, graduate student and who maybe just arrived from another continent and who is totally, you know, lost as to all of these other things that can be done, need to be done outside of their day-to-day -day graduate school work. Is, do you have some some advice for them? Yeah, I will say, so it, it is possible to do it. I know it can be really daunting, you know, realizing that you have to work and go to school. It's a lot to take in or to take on. Um, but I just want to remind people, like, it, it is possible and you can do it. One thing that has really helped me a lot is just staying as organized as possible. So I'm one of those people that has like a very detailed calendar. And, you know, at the beginning of the week, I like to sit down and just plan out my week. So if I know that I need to work on Monday and Tuesday, that gives me, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to do my schoolwork. And I think planning and just being organized with your time is so important. I know it sounds kind of obvious and like most people do that, but I think, you know, we, if you're able to just like take a moment with yourself and like kind of create little slots of times when you know you'll be able to do your schoolwork, that's so helpful. And then just working when you need to work. <laughs> so I'm someone that does procrastinate a lot, as we all do. But I think that, you know, if if you do have a lot going on, it's really important to just like, like I said, carve out those times in your schedule where you need to work and just force yourself to do it. Because you know that you'll feel a lot better if you get your work done. Um, I don't know if that's the sort of advice. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's perfect. Helpful. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh uh, and a question: If someone's listening, uh, someone who fits this this profile that I just shared, and wants to reach out to you, is LinkedIn the best uh, the best way to and to ask you maybe advice? Because often, like you said, mentorship has been important important for you. But I think that you might be now, and I say might be anyway. I don't want to push you to, to anything, but I think you you could now maybe be be in a mentor mentoring position versus someone who just arrived and just started their 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 PhD journey what's the best way to reach out to you that is, that is uh, kind of you know public and not your direct email address <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I will say I'm super open to that if anyone has any questions or wants to talk I would love to to hear from them um LinkedIn is great yeah LinkedIn you can Excellent. send me a message on there that's that's perfect Dominique Luer, L-O-U-E-R. You don't need to put the, the umlaut, but uh, it, there's an umlaut on top of the E. Yes. There we go. <laughs> ah, the French. Uh, Dom Dominique, I, I have this uh, kind of summary of, you, of the story that you shared today and of, of all you shared. Of course, you, you, you said many things. You've, we've covered a lot of ground, like I said. But... Uh, a week ago, I saw you do a presentation and, and tried to follow me to this this reflection, and then maybe I'll I'll let you have a final final word based on what I I'm going to share with you. A week ago, I saw you, you know, being uh, handed a big one of those big uh, uh, checks uh, <laughs> because you were the winner of this uh, three minute thesis competition. Uh, you did really well. Um, Ever since I've seen you there, uh, then I, I, you know, we met in person, and now here, all I see in you uh, is uh, there's a lot of positivity. You have this this will to uh, learn, to discover. You you want to have a project that affects people positively. That came out in your presentation, but it, it's part of the why I, I think of your research, and um, you know. We talked about doing all of this out of spite, and it looks to me that you know there's nothing in you that tells me that you're a spiteful person, not at all. Uh, and what would you say to this idea that I'm going to share right now? That is, next time you're on a podium, because I think you you're going to win other uh, other <laughs> other uh, things in the future. What do you think about thanking all these people who were naysayers, let's say, about your future <laughs> in the past and actually taking the time to say, thank you, you propelled me into this journey that I am today. What do you think about that idea? I really like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So 
I think that's you know I was talking about spite and it, I, it was just for for the fun of it because I thought it was a <laughs> funny idea. <laughs> but uh, I think this is much more aligned with the energy that you give, um, and uh, and I feel that these people helped you somehow. Uh, it's hard to see to say exactly how, but they kind of kindled this fire in you that's been burning until today, and that I feel is going to burn uh, for for a long time still. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I thank you so much for having for having shared all these stories with me and with the Papa PhD uh, audience. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm super super happy that you accepted this. I wish you all the best for your projects, uh, and um, yeah, I'm super thankful that we crossed paths and that you accepted to come share your story here today. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure, and I'm I'm really glad that we were able to have this conversation. Well, me too. I think there's a lot of inspiration uh, uh, in what you shared for the people who are either watching or who are listening uh, on their on their podcast apps. Um, if you have any questions or feedback, you know you've already said that people can reach out to you on LinkedIn. Um, if there's anything again that you uh, want to. Uh, write back to the show uh, about just write to david at papaphd.com i'll be glad to answer any questions too um and uh, and that's it thank you so much for having been here today dominique uh, all the best to your project and thanks to all of you who have been watching live this has been another live recording of beyond the thesis with papa phd See thank you, you so much <laughs> bye bye so I'm going to close the live, but we're going to stick around a little bit.